we did it. It's, it, it's finally time after <laughs> so, so many opportunities. And it, it just felt like in games like this, come up short. And finally, here in Atlanta, State Farm Arena, Kentucky takes down North Carolina by a final score of 87 to 83. Jack Pilgrim here at State Farm Arena with Sean Smith. Uh, Sean, just an unbelievable start to finish effort for the Kentucky Wildcats where they there were 15 opportunities for them to let go of the rope. They they led from start to finish with the exception of maybe 11 seconds, I think, but there were a lot of opportunities for a veteran-led UNC team to kind of take back over and kind of do what happened to Kentucky against against Kansas earlier in the season, but we hit the daggers. Kentucky finally threw the daggers and forced UNC to go home with a really, really tough loss for them and a really unbelievably rewarding victory for the Kentucky Wildcats. We've talked about resume. We've talked about the, the importance of getting a strong quality victory, and they got it in probably the best way imaginable, Sean. I've been talking all year about checkpoints. You had the first opportunity versus Kansas at, at the Champions Classic. Kentucky came up short. You had Miami at Rupp Arena a few weeks ago. Kentucky gets a big win. Now we're questioning whether or not that Miami team is any good. Today was, was another one that kind of validated that Kentucky is. Jack, that's one of the best well-played basketball games I've seen all season in college basketball. Like you, Kentucky and North Carolina live up to the hype again. The names on the back of the jersey change, but the results and the hype always stay the same. It is always an instant classic, especially in this event and in the regular season. Kentucky got what we were calling a must-win game going into the week. It was a must-win game for a non-con resume. Kentucky has a quad one win now on its resume. And its freshmen delivered daggers to win this one. That was the difference in the game. Kentucky's freshmen grew up a lot over the course of the last month since that game against Kansas, and they hit big-time shots down the stretch to close this thing out. And this wasn't Malik Monk going for 47. This was Rob Dillingham, 17, DJ Wagner, 14, Aaron Bradshaw, 12, Reed Shepard, 11. Uh, I mean, you have eight different guys scoring at least seven points. I mean, the the – well-roundedness of this victory where it wasn't just one guy that you lean on and say, well, it is what it is. Malik Monk became Malik Monk. This was uh, several guys putting together solid all-around performances to lead this team to victory. And it, it all came in individual clutch moments, which was unbelievable. Aaron Bradshaw hitting the, two, the, the back-to-back clutch free throws there at the end of the game. DJ Wagner finishing tough off the left, had that awesome floater kind of where yep. he went ISO and said, all right, this is my time to shine. This is this is my bucket. Rob Dillingham back-to-back buckets. Reed Shepard, you know, putting in crunch time to make big passes, not necessarily even big shots. He hit the big shots, but, you know, he wanted – Cal put him in to make – clutch moments outside of scoring, they all checked those boxes. There wasn't one guy that emerged greater than any of them. It was just an unbelievably well-rounded performance. Cal, as I I think transparent about his optimism with this group as we've you know he says I like my team and all that but this for the first time he said that was a Final Four team and if that's a Final Four team what does that make us? Somebody asked him that question he said our upside is pretty scary and we'll see what happens when we get a, another seven footer back we you know, the sky is the limit with this group Cal said and you can see it we, we talked after that Kansas game that you see a final four in this team's future this just kind of kind of reinforces that optimism well he, he he said too we'll see if we get there and now you know what Kentucky can be and, and the entire country sees it this is a team that just beat a top 10 team that's two top 10 wins versus AP top 10 teams but Miami, as we said, kind of fallen off since that game, but North Carolina was a team coming in that John Calipari believes is a Final Four caliber team. I think the same thing. They held Armando Baycott in check. How many turnovers did he finish with today? I know it won't be Almost as five. many as, uh, as his points. So six, six, turnovers six turnovers to nine points. Uh, really aggressive against him early. A Duthiero in some double teams, I think, rattled him kind of early. They, they also ran a half-court trap and then forced the ball to him, and he turned it over kind of getting downhill. But just overall, Kentucky's game plan, but it came down to it, Jack, you have to make shots to win. You had D.J. Wagner going left for a bucket. You had Aaron Bradshaw, offensive rebound in a basket. Then you get Rob Dillingham with a couple of baskets back-to-back. Those freshmen made plays. That is something that's been missing the last few years with this program was guys that could go get their own in situations. Games naturally slow down late. This was an up-and-down tempo in-transition game for about 34 minutes. And in the final six minutes, things slowed down. Kentucky did get stagnant, 
But when it got stagnant, it still had dudes. It had dudes that could go get a play for themselves. And Kentucky had that in Rob. It had it in DJ. Aaron goes and gets an offensive rebound. How about Reed Shepard being the trigger man on some inbound situations late in games? That right there shows you that John Calipari trusts him. Now, a lot of people are talking, hey, I'd like to have Reed as the guy getting fouled shooting free throws. you got to get the ball inbounds first. That is priority number one, and that's who Cal trusts to get the ball inbounds. But Aaron Bradshaw missed, some, missed a free throw, goes to the line and hits too late. Cal trusted his guys not to foul, but he, he did kind of joke and say that that's not really what he said. But – Kentucky gets a big win here in Atlanta in the CBS Sports Classic and just a massive quad one win for the Cats. One of my favorite stories from post-game, Cal, the rumor of Ugo being sick yeah. grew loud and loud and louder and loudest leading up to this event. And there was a lot of talk that he wasn't even going to make the trip. He ended up not making the trip. Up until today, Cal said that he had to get flown in individually. He flew in this morning barely made shoot around and in shoot around threw up everywhere because he has the flu and Cal didn't want to play him as much as he did said that he hoped for five minutes but you know just kind of crunch time however he was needed you know a body to throw at Armando Baycott a, a, a shot blocking presence in case they needed that a, kind of a break in case of emergency guy he comes in and, and provides really valuable minutes for Kentucky especially Aaron Bradshaw going out with four fouls early in the second half you needed that one kind of complimentary piece. And there was so much talk about pace of play and how things would change with Ugo in the lineup. I will be honest, I, I wasn't as concerned with Aaron Bradshaw, not as concerned with Zvonimir Visic, but Ugo was the one kind of outlier where you, could, uh, you said, okay, how did he fit into that pure basketball player mold where Cal's going five out, offense kind of moving forward and sticking with the times this year. He was the one guy that there were questions about, and I thought he fit in tremendously. It wasn't a, a huge game-changing presence on the box score, but his three blocks were as, as valuable as ever and uh, really did a lot of really good things. But that's a guy that should not have even had to have been out there because of how sick he was. Yeah, and, and Kentucky's depth showed today. It, its depth finally showed what it has now on the interior and what it has in the backcourt. This is now a team that can go big, they can go small, they can play fast. His shot blocking, what do you have, three block shots today? Kentucky had nine as a team. How about a do the arrow? Four block shots. So getting some rim protection that was missing there early in the season. But one key moment in the game was North Carolina goes on a run there late in the first half. Rob Dillingham has a, break, has a layup, what we thought was a breakaway, ends up being a block shot. That's a massive five-point swing because North Carolina goes and hits a three. They hit another three. The way Kentucky responded was with a 7-0 run to start the second half. They got off to a 9-4 start in the first media se segment of the first half. They go on a 7-0 run to start the second half. That is a huge stretch and way to start both halves. So I thought that was very important, too, for Kentucky to get off to that start in the second half. We've talked a lot about balanced scoring with this team. We've talked about balanced assists with this team. How about balanced rebounding? When you go down that list, you, you see uh, total rebounds there. Justin Edwards with six. You had Trey Mitchell with five. Antonio Reeves with four, DJ Wagner with six, Reed Shepard with six. Like that's balance and by committee on the glass. You mentioned it earlier. This isn't a game where somebody just goes for 40 something like Malik Monk did. There's no SEC Player of the Week, SEC Freshman of the Week honors from this, but you got a Team of the Week because that was a team victory against a very, very good opponent. Uh, Hubert Davis said after the game, we lost in the trenches. You don't win games if you lose the way that they did. Ten. Uh, 10 uh, rebounding de deficit for UNC. They just said, you know, you have a Armando Baycott. You have one of the best rebounders in college basketball, and Kentucky kind of babied him. I mean, Armando had a really bad game, and I thought the game plan was excellent for, for Armando. The, their ability to trap him, make him uncomfortable, force him into ugly passes, and, you know, keep him out of the, the paint, try to limit his control of the of the paint and everything else kind of fit well around him uh, because of that. It, it just the, the, the game plan was excellent, I thought, from start to finish. I, I really thought it was high-level coaching. You saw John Calipari during his post-game press conference as swaggy as we have heard him saying, oh, I thought our, our pace of play was going to change. I thought everybody was so scared about another big getting thrown in the mix. What, what happened there? I thought that was crazy. I said that this team wasn't going to change. And it didn't change. I mean, this 87 points in an environment like this, and um, it, they're checking all of the boxes, Sean. Yeah. This is a team that you kind of saw the vision and you saw spurts, but could they put it together for 40 minutes? And they damn near led for the entire 
the entirety of that 40 minutes. Look, well, Kentucky runs good stuff, too, on the offensive end. Whether they've got two bigs on the floor or one big on the floor, their offense is really, really good. And we'll dive into that on Sources Say and stuff this week. And I almost let this slip my mind. I told it to you when we got to the postgame press conference. So I'm, I'm standing in the U.K. tunnel. Mitch Barnhart's coming through. He has a big smile on his face. He goes over to Will Barton, and he says, it's been a while. And you could finally kind of sense the relief. It has been a while since Kentucky's won one of these games against the North Carolina. I know they beat them in, the, in this event a few years ago, blood win for a, by a North Carolina team that kind of went on to a run there at the national championship, beat Kansas on the road. But just these moments where you kind of just think Kentucky's about to have something good go its way. It lost to UNC Wilmington a couple weeks ago without DJ Wagner. I still think that's a Kentucky, Kentucky victory if he plays. Aaron Bradshaw working his way in. Today you work Ugo in. So a lot of new things are happening over the last couple of weeks, but now you see it. And this is a team now that has a quad one victory on its resume heading into a matchup with Louisville and then going into the conference play here very soon. I, that was a massive had-to-have win in its non-conference resume today. Uh, a couple special guests in attendance. John Short was sitting next to Santo Ciro. I don't know how that happened, but whoever coordinated those that duo – well done. Tip of the cap to you. Uh, John Wall was courtside and had a lot of back and forth moments with Rob Dillingham and John Calipari actively talking to him during the game. That part was really cool. And then on my way out, I actually saw Caleb Wilson, 2025 five star, one of Kentucky's top targets for that class, you know, top five recruit in the nation, was leaving the stands very clearly excited and happy. He's a Georgia native. Uh, for you know, a high-level recruit to be able to see this product in his you know hometown, again, it's it was just they checked all of the boxes as high as you you, you had to get a, a quad one victory. You had to start building a resume. That's kind of the the, yep. the the tip of all this, and even as low as just recruiting momentum and other things kind of behind the scenes. Uh, th this game was so necessary, so important, and they finally got it. Sean, as as Mitch Barnhart said, it's been a while, and it felt really really good to to knock this one out. I'm leaving Atlanta very, very pleased. Yeah, I'm leaving Atlanta very, very pleased too because, I, like I said, I've been talking about checkpoints. You and I did the rapid reaction together in Chicago a little over a month ago, and we talked positive about this team and to, to kind of stay the course that this thing has a chance to end in Phoenix with Kentucky in a Final Four, maybe runner-up or a national champion. Who knows how, what happens when they get there. The upside is there. How about this building today? How about the energy in this place? Two fan bases. I know it's Kentucky-Louisville when you're talking rivalries. It's Kentucky-Tennessee in the SEC, Kentucky-Duke. You give me Kentucky and North Carolina every single time because it's an instant classic regardless of where this thing's played. Both so fan bases soft, showed up man. today. Jack, I've been on this beat seven years. That's the best neutral court environment I have ever been in on this show. Just as many let's go heels as there were let go big blue, and they were like, battling each other it was you you heard i mean it was probably a 50 50 split between unc and, and kentucky fans that's how it should be this event is must see tv for people sitting at home you guys watching at home i i, I know it was just as much fun but even being here it, it's equally as fun this is what college basketball is about this event this environment these teams this is what you want to see and um i, I thought it was a really good quote from from trey mitchell afterward they asked you know kind of had a march madness feel to it and it um Trey said it felt like we were about to go on a run. Kind of has that feel to it with this team, doesn't it? It absolutely does. And, and when you're, you're just looking at it, too, like this event, there's been a couple of years where it's been way too close to Christmas. And that kind of hurts some attendance. Today, you've got plenty of time between now and Christmas. Kentucky's got another game sandwiched between that and the holiday. So just I talked to somebody pregame, and I said that I felt this thing needed to move away from neutral floors and keep the same matchups that play on as home and homes. I don't think so after being in this environment today. UCLA, Ohio State, there was barely anyone in the building. By the time tip-off between Kentucky and North Carolina, this place was, was full, and there was so much juice in the building. This felt like an Elite Eight game to go to a Final Four or a Final Four National Championship level game. And the fans brought it. The players brought it. How about John Calipari getting a technical there in the first half because he was so amped up. A lot of people – I, I get it. You can't get one in that moment, but I think it was kind of over, out of proportion a little bit there. I was more the play that Rob got blocked that kind of started North Carolina's run than the technical. But Kentucky handled some adversity. North Carolina made shot after shot down the stretch. Every time Kentucky would get it to four or five, North Carolina hits a three. Kentucky's dudes answered in the end. Kentucky gets a massive win, Jack, and, and I think a lot of respect for what they've done today. <sighs> uh, the, uh, 
my, my heart is beating out of my chest. It's starting to slow down a little bit. I'm starting to catch my breath. It's time to get out of here. It's time to regroup and go beat the absolute hell out of Louisville. Fill the Yum Center. It's going to be empty. They have players in the stands. It's just an absolute madhouse down at Louisville. Fill, fill the Yum Center. Make it, make it a sea of blue and make a statement because they made UK fans made a statement down here in Atlanta. Let's keep this momentum rolling. Let's keep it going into the new year. Keep it going into conference play. The Cats are in an awesome, awesome spot following an unbelievable victory over UNC. Jack Pilgrim, uh, Sean Smith. We'll see you next time.